uh, former Olympic champion um, and uh, U.S. champion and national champion, the whole thing. Um, figure skater Brian Boitano, former figure skater Brian Boitano, who's been the host on the Food Network of What Would Brian Boitano, Boitano Make for what, what? Now three years or so, Brian? Yeah, I started the show back in 2009, and um, it was showing on Food Network, and then it moved to Cooking Channel, and that's what basically the book is named after, that show. Yeah, no, what would Brian Boitano make? That, that's the name of the book, Fresh and Fun Recipes for Sharing with Family and Friends. How, how on earth did, a, did a, a, an athlete uh, and, a, and a figure skater, an Olympic gold medalist, how'd you, how'd you get into cooking? Was this something after you left sk you know, skating or, or something that you've always dabbled in? Or how did it become uh, so prominent in your life? Yeah, you know, um, after I finished Olympic competition, um, I bought a house and all my friends used to like to come over to my house and uh, cook meals in the evening. So we would all cook something different. And I started developing all these recipes from that time. So 25 years ago, I just kept uh, developing recipes, different fun things to eat, how to entertain. And I wrote them down, and they are all my favorite recipes. And so they turned into the cookbook. I also um, had a focus on, like, my travels because I've traveled and eaten around the world since I've been thir 13 or 14 years old. And um, that's inspired a lot of the recipes and a lot of the way that I look, about, look, look toward food. Well, I would imagine that most of the recipes in the book, uh, be, being that you're an athlete and being that uh, athletes uh, tend to take care of their bodies, if they're, uh, on the other hand, if they're not put, putting steroids or drugs and abusing them, uh, that you're, you're cooking healthy stuff here for the most part. You know what? They are. Um, they're, they're fun. They're easily accessible. I have a rule that if my friends can't make it, then I don't want to put it in the book. It's, they're very simple, but they can be dressed up to go into the dining room. Or the way that I entertain now is really taking everything into the kitchen in a very casual way. I do, I'm really into the mixology, um, drinks and stuff like that. And I have my friends contribute in the kitchen. So we just sit around you know, the kitchen island, and I make really simple but really delicious you know, appetizers or entrees, and we just sit and eat and, and and make cocktails as we go. I really think it's the new way of entertaining. And when you're when you you know all these years, as you mentioned, on the road and traveling uh, the world since you were 13 or 14, um, I, I, looking back on that, and and even in, you know as you got older and you, and you you know you turned pro and then and we went back to the Olympics in '94, but you know skating uh, venues and whatnot, it, it's it's hard uh, as an athlete uh, tra or anyone traveling around for a living basically uh, or. As part of their their professional living to to eat right it's like you know you know, go on vacation you tend to overeat if you're traveling for work you know you grab it on the run and you eat down in the hotel restaurants or whatever but it's it's hard you never feel like you're eating right absolutely it's very hard on the road and that's why i relished all my time at home when i could have friends over and eat eat correctly and entertain and make really great dishes and through that time i discovered these tips and they're all in the book too of like i have a salsa spread and sauces plan where i'll make something different so i'll make my pork tenderloin with warm plum salsa and i'll keep the plum salsa for a week and put it on to different proteins so it's you just have to make it once during the week and it can really make everything that you have during the rest of the week tasty including sandwiches and so with active lifestyle people like moms or everybody's you know everybody's busy these days it's really uh, like my tips to cut corners and, and make everything every day something, you know, that's worth eating. Well, we'll get back to the book in a second. Let me let me ask you, looking back uh, at your career and, and looking at the state of, uh, of the sport now and looking at the Olympics now, um, how is how has it all changed? I mean, I, I would imagine first of all, you know, because I know, I know what goes into you know my son loves hockey. Um, he's thirteen, and you know, but dad, I want to play hockey in, in ice hockey in high school, but you can't unless you dedicate. Uh, and I've seen the kids his age that do dedicate, and I've seen how they skate. He's a great athlete. My son, he plays street hockey. They won their championship. He plays baseball. But if you're going to skate. Uh, you have to get up. At, I mean, there are kids I know that get up at 5 in the morning to hit the ice before school, and they do this almost every day. If you want to be perfect at it or great at it, isn't that what it takes for skating? Yeah, I, it's the same. I, I used to get up at 4.30 in the morning to go skating. It's, I think it's a passion. I mean, if, if kids, kids are interested in something, they're going to be passionate, and then that is one of the key ingredients to – make what you do a success. So, you know, I was lucky to find skating that I'm passionate about, and I'm really lucky because food, I think everybody's passionate about food, but I'm, I'm passionate about entertaining and making food and doing that now. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, but I just want to take it back. And how has the sport 
change. I mean, you know, we, we know about professional sports like baseball and football and, and the, 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 the steroids use and all that. What about, what about skaters? I mean, has that ever been a factor? And uh, you need a lot of stamina out there on the ice, obviously, yeah. and it's a lot of hours of practice, and there's a lot of muscle involved in the legs and the thighs, et cetera, and the upper body too, um, you know, for the, the, the pairings and even, even just to, to skate around by yourself as a figure skater. Uh, steroids or, 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 or kind of performance-enhancing drugs, has that been a factor in, in figure skating? You know, it really hasn't, and I think the reason is is because um, skaters don't want bulk. They, it's, it's harder to spin four times in the air when you're bulky, uh, even though you have the strength. Uh, skaters want to develop different types of muscles. So it's a combination of, you know, burst strength and stamina, and um, so there's really never been an issue uh, with performance-enhancing drugs because of that reason. Let me ask you this. I've always wondered this. Um, I'm a big hockey fan and, and uh, have been for my whole life. How do you compare, when you look at NHL skaters and, and, and watch them play, obviously it's completely different you know, than, uh, than, than what you do. But do you, do, do you marvel at them? Do they marvel at you? Do you marvel at each other? I mean, it's probably two different types of things. But could you do what they do you know, with the speed and the agility and, and, and this, the, you know, the physical uh, uh, ability it takes? And could they do, if trained, what you do? I mean, t talk about the differences involved and, and what you think of NHL players on a skill level. I think that there's a mutual respect between hockey players and figure, skater, figure skaters. They're, you know, it's a whole different thing. Um, they, they, do, they practice a lot of scrimmaging and um, stick handling and shooting. And so it's a whole different thing. They couldn't jump and, you know, spin and do the tricks right. like we do. But it would be really difficult for us to learn how to you know, handle a stick and shoot um, as well as they do. But, and get yeah, hit, and we, get hit as well, I guess, all exactly, the while, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. They're to totally different things, but in, in actuality, um, there's a mutual respect. I mean, I can see a hockey player um, skate and go like, wow, they've got a really, you know, a great stroke. Their knees are soft. Um, I can tell, you know, what type of skater they are. That's interesting. All right, now, as far as yeah. the Olympics go, and, I'll, and then we'll get back to the book in a second, as far as the Olympics go, um, the, 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 um, the, the figure skating has always been of the, of the Winter Olympics. You know, TV ratings will, will bear this out, certainly, and basketball, you know, in its time slots. But figure skating, there's always a, a darling, you know, that comes out of the figure skating, whether it's a male or a female. Um, there's always somebody, if, especially if it's American, uh, that uh, just, you know, the, the whole nation roots for. I guess that's true in any sport, but... but do you think it's it's more so in figure skating? Well, yeah, and you know what? Figure skaters are very lucky because their um, their career, uh, a whole other career can start after the Olympics. There's no other Olympic sport that has the side of entertainment to it. Um, figure skaters are very lucky. It's, you know, if, if they're lucky enough to win an Olympic medal, they can parlay it into a whole other as a professional skater in shows and tours and everything. And we were really um, fortunate to be able to be in such great, you know, years when, when figure skating was, you know, selling out crowd, you know, crowds were just selling out buildings and there were TV shows everywhere. So um, that's the difference. And, and we, we all feel very fortunate that we're in, you know, that sport. Um, is there a stigma for young young kids or anybody who wants to get involved? Do they do, do kids and, and, and adults to an extent think of figure skating as a, as a girl's sport? How do you motivate yeah. guys, you know, boys you know or young I, men to do it? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. Like I said, it has to be passionate. Um, there, you know, I never had any trouble when, when I was younger. People were really supportive of me, and, and I didn't even, you know, notice anything. It was just something that I was passionate about. It was something that I really, really wanted to do. Um, I can't imagine, you know, that there would be too much, you know, of a, of a stigma. I'm sure, you know, um, maybe in some areas, but, you know, you got to listen to what your kids want to do. And if they're passionate about it, they really want to do it. That's what my parents said, you know, didn't hold me back at all. All right. Now, the hardest question of all uh, from your book, What Would Brian Boitano Make? Um, give me the one single favorite dish in this entire book for you. Okay. Yours. Well, okay. I can't give you two. Uh, well, I see. I asked for one, but because because I, uh, I, I we've had a good conversation. Go ahead, give me two. Okay, so the first one I like is um, a sea bass. It's on a bed of roasted cauliflower and apples. And whenever I serve this, it's uh, it's a pureed cauliflower and apple. People think it's potatoes, and it's completely delicious. It's low cal. It's healthy. It's simply cauliflower apples 
a little olive oil and uh, vegetable broth, and I put it in the food processor, and I use it as a bed for any type of protein. And people just go to that and eat it all the time instead of potatoes. And that's, you know, really popular right now, the low-carb thing. Yeah, and, and by the way, the is this thing, extra yeah. virgin olive oil or it doesn't matter? Uh, yeah, it is. It doesn't, but it doesn't matter. Okay. It really doesn't okay. matter. And um, then my, my other thing is a pork shoulder. I braise, which is, means slow cook in a pineapple juice a pork shoulder until it falls apart. And so it has the flavor of the pineapple juice. And then on the top, I put brown sugar, paprika, coriander, cumin, and I put it under the broiler after it's fall apart tender. And then it gets a crunchy exterior on the top. And so it's the mixture of like that tenderness and that crunchy top that is really delicious and people, you know, really like it. In fact, you could put it on the bed of the cauliflower and apple puree, too. So. All right. Now, now, now go, that's one. if you were having, God forbid, you knew it was going to be your last meal, which one would it, which one of those two dishes would it be? You know what? I would do the pork shoulder because I love braised meat. Anything that's slow cooked and is fall off the right. bone, well, I have good. a See, lamb shank. You just too, wanted you like just that. wanted to get in as many recipes as possible to plug no, the no, book. It's no, true. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You could have picked one all along. Hey, Brian, great talking to you. Thank you very much. Good luck with the book, sir. Thank you so much. Nice talking. All right, take to care. You. you too. That's uh, what would Brian Boitano make, and um, he's got a TV show of the same name on the Food Network.